So a couple of things admin wise that I want to point out really quick is my work week ends Fridays at 1.30 PM. Um, the reason why it ends at 1.30 is because I have four hours extra during the Monday through Thursday after school hours. So they give me a couple hours off early on Friday. Um, I do not use my home PC for anything related to school, the schoolwork. Um, so the only questions I answer on the weekends are basically quick things I can answer by email on my phone. I don't even look at email on my PC at the house. So plan in advance. Your best time is to ask questions during office hours. And this entire day on Fridays, nine o'clock to 1.30 is pretty much office hours. And when I'm eating lunch, I, I still have one of the meats open. So you can look there. So when you come into class, we did our warm-up exercises. Um, if you are showing me homework in class, the way you the two the way you indicate this is when your homework is done, you submit it in Google Classroom, but you leave a comment uh, um, telling me you're going to show me in class in Google Classroom. So when you go to submit the thing, there's a place to leave a comment. You do that. And in general, make sure you type it. You're typing in burning questions. That's a daily thing. I'm, I'm going to stop putting your reminders for the completing the warm up questions and putting burning questions into chat um, because those should be part of our daily routine now. So the warm up questions. Okay, they all looked better a little earlier, but now they look like garbage. So which one is equivalent to, I believe it said two cubed. I'm going to have to open it on the other computer. Um, and the question is, yes, which is equivalent to two cubed? Raising something to a power is repeated multiplication. So this is two times two times two. The next one, I'm sorry that the picture didn't come in. Negative 7y plus 19 is less than 75. And they wanted to know which one of the numbers that I have on the right is not a solution. So what I need to do is I need to solve for y. First thing I'm going to do is subtract 19 from both sides, which would give me... 56. Then I need to divide both sides by negative 7. So 56 divided by negative 7 is negative 8. Now here's the, where students are going to have some problems. When you multiply or divide an inequality by a negative number, you need to flip the inequality symbol. So the correct, the ones that are solutions are any number bigger than negative eight. Well, 13 is bigger than negative eight. Zero is bigger. Negative two is bigger. Negative eight is equal to negative eight, so it is not bigger, so the answer was negative eight. On this group, I'm gonna delete the picture since they look um, messy. What I want to do is I'm just going to come up with the numbers that we are going to compare to the tables that were there. She gets a gift card worth $25. Worth $25. Each smoothie costs $325. Which table best describes the balance remaining after she buys in number of smoothies? So what I would do to do this problem is I wouldn't even look at the tables. I would give my, make my own table, and then compare my answers to the other one. If I buy zero smoothies, I've got a brand new card, I've got $25. I buy one smoothie, I subtract $3.25 from my balance. And that gives me $21.75. I buy two smoothies, I subtract another $3.25. 1850. And I give myself a couple more numbers, 1525 and $12. And then I look at my numbers 
compare them to the table to see which one would work. And if you look at the table, my numbers match, let's see, two matches, three matches, and the answer is D on that one. No, let me check again. 2175, 1525. Uh, one, three, four. Yeah, the answer is A on that one. Those match. So make your own table. Uh, I didn't even write an equation for this. I could have written an equation. You guys should be used to writing equations. The balance is equal to $25 minus the number of smoothies times $3.25. So that would be an equation that I could use for that. So the burning question, the only thing I saw in chat was number five on the quiz. I am not actually gonna do any of them on the quiz. I'm just gonna explain the instructions. It says an exercise is five to eight, check whether the given number is a solution to the equation or inequality. What that's telling you is to stick this number in for the variable and tell me whether you get a true sentence. For example, if I have 5x minus 14 is greater than 52 with x, um, I'm not even going to put the number. I put a semicolon there, and I'm going to put a 12. That means put the 12 in for x. And then check to see if I get a true sentence. 5 times 12 is 60. 60 minus 14 is 46. Is 46 bigger than 52? The answer would be no. Okay, so for 5, 6, 7, and 8, you're just giving me a yes or a no, whether you get a true sentence when you stick the numbers in there. So new stuff for today. So if, you're, if you actually do take notes in my class, this is the stuff that you're going to be wanting to take notes on. Okay, I will slow down a little bit because of the laggy stuff. So today we need to talk about accuracy and precision. Okay. Um, if you have Mr. Brown for his for physical science or have already had them, um, he also talks about this. So in general, accuracy is how close you are to the desired result. Okay, you're accurate if you if your guess or your solution is very close to the desired result. Your um, precision is how close your answers are together. That's the way we want to think about this. How close a group of answers. are from each other. So let's talk about this in terms of maybe a shop class. Okay? In shop, I need to measure something. Okay? I can get a steel rule that has one inch subdivisions. The accuracy that I can measure something with one inch subdivisions is whatever my number of inch, basically to a half inch. You can measure your accuracy as one half the smallest subdivision. Okay, or I can measure something that has um, quarter inches. So there's an inch, there's an inch, that it's broken down into quarter inches. So the half of the smallest subdivision in this case would mean I could get down to an eighth inch 
of accuracy. Now, let's say I have 20 people in my class and they all measure the same board. The precision is how close each person, how close all the answers are. If somebody gets uh, 13 inches and somebody else gets five inches, um, they're not very precise. Okay, they're not, I'm not being able, the big word I want to look for here is repeatability. Okay. So accuracy is how close I can get to the desired result. Precision is the repeatability of those results. So here's some pictures that may help out on that. The middle one, all my results are together. So they are precise, but they are not near the bullseye. So they are not accurate. Okay. The first one, they're pretty close to the bullseye. All of them are fairly decently close to the bullseye, but the dots themselves are not very close to each other. So that gave me the low precision. If all the dots are in the bullseye and they're all up together, that is the high accuracy, high precision. If you have any questions on that basic concept, please type them in chat. So if I'm measuring something in inches or centimeters, the thing that I'm measuring, if I measure it in centimeters, I am going to be more accurate because centimeters are physically smaller than my inches are. If I'm measuring it in feet compared to yards, the feet are going to be more accurate because they have smaller subdivisions. That's the gist that I want you to get from accuracy and precision here. The other thing we need to talk about is significant digits. In order to talk about significant digits, the first thing we need to do is we need to talk about zeros. We have three kinds of zeros. The first kind are what are called leading zeros. They're the ones that occur when you have basically a decimal that does not have a whole number portion with it. So the two zeros in red right here are called leading zeros. The second type of zeros we have are trailing zeros. They are the parts that fill in a whole number, or are there any zeros after the end of a non-zero in a decimal portion? And the last kind of zero we have would be what we would call a middle zero. These are not special. Um, what we're really concerned is about our leading zeros and our trailing zeros. We need to come up with, um, basically, we need to count the number of digits that are significant. That's what they mean by significant digits. Okay? So, what we do is, um, let me move the rules up. Our rules for significant digits. If it is a... We're going to call it a whole number. We're going to start off with whole numbers. Do not count trailing zeros. For example, this one. Ah. This one right here is a whole number. We do not count its trailing zeros when I count the significant digits. So I'm not going to count this digit. I'm going to count the rest of them. One, two, three, four. This one has four significant digits. Okay. If I have a decimal, um, with a whole number, that's in front of the decimal. For example, this second one right here, we count all digits 
Okay. So this one would have six. If it is a decimal without a whole number, Okay, so another one for this, this previous example. This one meets that case. This is a whole num this is a decimal, the point zero, with the whole number. I count every one of those digits, which is four. Even though that zero, okay, that's no longer that, that is a trailing zero, but it's a trailing zero and a decimal, I count that one. If it is a decimal without a whole number portion. We are not going to count leading zeros. So for these two, uh, I've got to mark my move and everything. So for these two, I do not count the leading zeros. So this one, the first one only has two. This second one, I don't count these leading zeros, but I do count the trailing zero because um, we do not count leading zeros. I'm going to put it up here. We do count the trailing zeros. So in this case, I would have three significant digits. Those are our general rules for counting our significant digits. We're going to do some practice problems with these. Um, I should have had another slide in here. Yep, I need to. Um, I'm going to put another slide right here. Other notes, when you are multiplying or dividing and you're told to make sure your answer has the correct number of significant digits, your answer will have the same number of significant digits as the least number of significant digits in any part of the problem. I'm going to do some examples of these in a little bit. I'm just giving the rules right now. So if you're multiplying or dividing, your answer is going to have this, whatever the lowest number of significant digits is out of the things you're multiplying or dividing. If you are adding or subtracting, what I really care about is how many decimal points do I write down? And your answer, your final answer will have the lowest number of decimal places of any part. And again, when I show the examples, this will make more sense. So how are we going to use this for our homework? First type of questions is tell me which thing is more precise. If I have the same unit of measure, I figure out which one is got the um, most decimal places and stuff like that. So here I have yards and yards. This one I'm measuring to two tenths of a yard. This one I'm measuring to whole yards. So 5.2 yards would be the most precise. 
if I am measuring between two different units and one unit has smaller increments than the other, that one is going to be the most precise one. So I have feet and yards. Feet are smaller than yards. 12 feet is more precise than four yards. Because if I'm measuring in feet, I, it could be 11 and a half feet. So if I'm measuring in feet, the actual measurement could be anywhere between 11 and a half to 12 and a half feet. If I'm measuring with a yardstick that just has one yard increments on it, this is anywhere between three and a half yards to four and a half yards. Okay, this is not very precise. Those numbers, if I actually, a half a yard is one and a half feet. So my rain, my accuracy, if I'm trying to hit the bullseye right here, I can go one and a half feet in that direction, one and a half feet in that direction. This one with my bullseye, I'm only a half foot away. So that's another way to see that um, precision in there. Pints are smaller than gallons, so it's going to be pints. Seconds are smaller than minutes, so it's seconds. Centimeters are smaller than meters, so it's centimeters. And ounces are smaller than pounds, so it is ounces. Okay? So in general, you want to use the thing that has the smallest unit of measure. Some examples of doing significant digits. If you have a whole number, you count everything except for trailing zeros. The first one does not have any trailing zeros, so I have one, two significant digits. If you have a decimal, you count the whole number portion plus everything after the decimal points. One, two, three. If you have a whole number with trailing zeros, you do not count the trailing zeros. This one will have three. This is my decimal one with a whole number portion. I count every one of those. It's five. I do not count the trailing zeros in the whole number one. So this one's 51. I mean, two. I do not count the leading zeros in a pure decimal problem but I do count the trailing zeros, so this one is also two. So you guys can see now how I use the rules to come up with the number of significant digits. So just being able to count them that really doesn't give me anything. I need to be able to count them so that when I do my mathematical operations, I can write my answer down with the correct number of significant digits. So if I take 120 times 45 thousandths, I get 5.4. But I need to look and see if 5.4 is the way I'm going to represent my answer. So I need to count the significant digits in each of my terms. Well, for 120, I don't count the trailing one. That one has two. For the 45 thousandths, I don't count the leading zeros. And this one has two. The smaller of two and two is two. My answer has to have two significant digits, and it does. So 5.4 would be a correct answer. For another problem, 125 has three significant digits. Four hundredths has one significant digit. The smaller between one and three is one. My final answer needs to have one significant digit. The number five does have one significant digit. So the first two, I didn't have to change anything. The next one, I will. I take 3256 times 120. 3256 has four significant digits. 120 has two of them. The lower of four and two is two. My final answer can only have two significant digits. So I'm going to write down the three, the nine, and then everything else needs to be a trailing zero. Now, this is where rounding comes into play. If you are getting rid of numbers, we need to round, okay? And the rules we're going to use for our class is one to four, we round down. 
Six to nine, we round up. And five, we round towards the even number. For example, if I have the number um, 1.5 and I want to round this to the nearest unit, I can either round it up to two or I can round it down to one. Two is even, so I would round this to two. Okay, if it was 1.7, it would always go to two because you always round six, the six to nines up. So in this class, one to four is down, six to nines up, five goes towards the even number. And the reason why I have five go towards the even number is because half the time you'll be going up, the other half the time you'll be going down, and they'll kind of equalize themselves out in the long run. Okay, some places, um, five to nines will always go up, but for this class, our fives go towards the even. Next problem I have is a division problem. 2,000 has one significant digit. 455 has three significant digits. The lower out of one and three significant digits is one. For me to represent this 4.3956 whatever with one significant digit, I get rid of that stuff behind the decimal point, and I would write down four as my answer. So four is the answer to that division problem to one significant digit. For addition and subtraction problems, what you do is you figure out which term has the least number of decimal places. This one has four decimals. This one has one, two, and three. The lowest number of decimal points I have is one. So my answer has to have just one decimal point. So what I need to do is I look at the two decimal points. This six is going to end up rounding up. Well, that's going to make that a zero. This one's going to become a three. And my final answer would be 253.0. And this zero needs to stay there because it is, one, it is a significant digit. So when you're adding or subtracting, your answer needs to have the same number of decimal places as the least number of decimals in the things that made it up. So the only thing I did differently is on this second one, I got rid of the 0 .2432. 113 has zero decimals, 121 has one, 5.672, the last one, three. The lowest number of decimal points in any of the terms that I'm using is zero. My final answer has to have zero decimal points. Well, that seven is gonna go away, so I need to know which way to round. Seven is between six and nine, so I'm gonna round it up. This, I'm gonna round that two up to a three, and my final answer would be 253. Are there any questions in general about adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing and coming up with the number of significant digits? My last two examples are story problems. Cortez is driving an average speed of 40.75 miles an hour. How far does he go in 45 minutes using the correct number of significant digits? So, what I need to do is figure out how many significant digits each term has. This one has four, this one has two. This is going to be a multiplication problem, okay? Um, and notice here, I'm gonna use 45. It has two significant digits. There are a whole bunch of ways for me to represent this when I go to solve my problem. But it is the original number of significant digits you have when you are doing the problem. For example, 45 minutes is 0.75 hours. Okay. 10 minutes, uh, no, let's do, let's do 15 minutes. So 0.75 has the same number of significant digits as the 45 does. Um, 15 is not going to work. I've got to find one 20 minutes. Here we go. Let's do 20 minutes. 20 minutes is one third of an hour, which is 0.3333 repeating. 
But here's the deal is if I have 20 minutes to start, that's one significant digit. When I'm doing the multiplication by turning it into hours, I would use only one three when I'm doing my multiplication. So you need to pay particular attention to where you start with significant digits and keep carrying that on for each successive thing. So using that information, I have, I'm going at 40.75 miles per hour. And I wanna know how far does he drive in 45 minutes? Well, 45 minutes um, is 0.75 hours. And if I multiply those two things together, I'm going to get um, 40.75 times 0.75. This gives me out of the calculator 30.5625. Now what I have to do is use the correct number of significant digits. The lower number between the 2 and the 4 is 2. So my final answer has to have two significant digits. The two significant digits are going to be the 3 and... This one right here, I have to round. Well, that 5625 is always going to round up. Okay, if it was just a bare five, this one I would have made 30. But because it's not a bare five, 56 is definitely going to round up. This becomes a 31. And my answer to two significant digits is 31 miles. Okay, next one. And our last one, Ashley is painting a patio that is 12.2 feet wide by 20.1 feet. How many square feet of floor space is she painting? So I need to figure out the area using the correct number of significant digits. Well, it's going to be the lowest of whatever terms I have. Well, this one's got three. This one has three. My final answer will have three significant digits. So I'm going to do the math. 12.2 times 20.1 is equal to 245.22 square feet. And now I have to give this to three significant digits. That would be the two, the four, and the five. And again, with square feet. So you write down everything that the calculator gives you, and then on your final answer, you just give me the number of significant digits that it is asking for.